Happy Resurrection Sunday. We all know why we're here today. Because Jesus is alive, man. Let's stand real quick. Let's bow our heads and we're going to pray, man. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father God, for this wonderful day, Lord, that you have made. This is the day you have made, God. And we're going to be glad and rejoice in this day, Lord, because you are alive today, Jesus. We open our hearts to you, God, that you speak to us. Give us understanding of your word this morning, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, somebody say amen. 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 As you find a seat, turn your Bibles to Philemon. The book of Philemon. I think he was a Jamaican. Philemon, right? Philemon, man. The book of Philemon. I'm pretty sure none of y'all read this little book. Within the New Testament, after Titus. If you don't know where Titus is, it's after uh, Matthew. Amen. The book of Philemon, amen. Now, Philemon is, is a disciple of Paul. Uh, he, he, he has a, a church in his home. So he's kind of like a pastor. Uh, he, he's a uh, wealthy man. He has a, a farm. He has land. He's very wealthy. And how many of you ever met someone that knows someone, right? You had a friend, hey, I know so-and-so, yeah, right? Maybe you're in prison and you know someone from this, you're from San Angelo, right? I mean, from, we were in jail, like, oh, I know so-and-so. You'd be someone that you had a familiar uh, knowing of someone, Right? This is what's going to happen. Paul's going to, he knows someone that knows Philemon. Amen. And so, Paul's in prison, and he's writing Philemon a letter. And so the first part of Philemon, he's like, God bless you, and and peace be with you, and and I'm I'm praying for you, I thank God for you. But in verse 10, he's writing a plea for a friend of his in prison. He says, I appeal to you for my child, Onimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person that is sending my very heart, whom I am wishing to keep with me so that on your behalf, he might be ministered to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. He falls out, I'm in prison. I'm sending this guy back to you because he, he really belongs to you. Amen. Verse 15. Start 14. For without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would not be ineffective by compulsion but of your own free will. Verse 15. For perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. Especially to me, but so much more to you, both in flesh and in the Lord. 17. If then you regard me a partner, Accept him as you would me. Here's a, here's a key verse, 18. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. 19. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand, and I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord and refresh my heart in Christ. For which one I have confidence in your obedience. I write to you since I know that you will even do more than what I say. Amen? So I read it, man. But let me uh, paint it very clear for you. 
Here's this man named Anus. And I'm pretty sure he probably stole from Philemon. He probably robbed him, probably took off, right? You know how people take off in the home with some other money, right? <laughs> right? Has anyone ever wronged you? Has anyone robbed your house or stole from you? And you know for good? Right? But here's his name. His name's Anonymous. Right? And he wronged Philemon. He took off. And guess where he ends up at? In prison. And as he's there in prison, guess who's in prison? Paul. Right? He was in Sicily. And man, he was selling this with Paul the Apostle. But as, about the other thing he knows is that Paul began to minister to him. He began to preach Jesus to him. And sure enough, he got saved. And sure enough, he began to understand the whole uh, uh, Christian life, and, and he got saved in prison. And on his release day, Paul says, he need to go back to Philemon. You need to go make amends. You need to make it right. But don't worry, I, I got you. And look what in verse 18, go back to verse 18. Look what Paul says. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Paul says, I'll, I'll take care of whatever he did wrong for you. Amen. And, and that's a picture of what Jesus did for you and me. Whatever we wrong God, Jesus said, you know what? Put that on my account. Uh, I've been to a restaurant one time. When I, when I first got out of outcry, right? Uh, I think I was uh, coming back from break or something, and, and me, my, my parents, my family were eating at a little restaurant down the street from the home. And, and we met a, a church member. Hey, God bless you. It's been a long time, right? And, and we, he leaves, and we finish eating, and we go and pay the bills. Says, you know what? It's, it's, really, it's really been taken care of. In other words, that God paid whose account? Or a bill. That's kind of, kind of what Jesus did on the cross. That Jesus paid our debt. Amen. This morning I want to talk on the topic of the righteousness of Jesus imputed into your life. Amen. You know, the word imputation, it, it, it's a, a doctrine word that we learn in Bible school. But it, it means this imputation means. To set down to want to count. To set down and to want to count. In other words, to, to deposit into someone else's account. How many of you got a stimulus? Oh, no one's going to raise their hand, right? Amen. This ain't no uh, tithing uh, sermon. We don't want your stimulus. Right? But, but just how the government deposited that stimulus into your account... That, that is what called imputation. That, that, that's what happened is someone sat down into one to count. In other words, Jesus took the debt that we owe to God and he charged himself with our debt. And then he deposits his righteousness into your account. Amen? So check this out. When Adam sinned, not, not this Adam, right? But uh, original Adam. The man, the OG Adam. Adam's sin was imputed unto the whole human race. If you have your Bible, go into Romans 5, verse 12. Romans 5, 12. I'm going to quote uh, Romans 6.23. This is for the wages of sin is what? Death. Death, right? Wages of sin, right, is what? Death. Death. What, what did God tell Adam what would happen if he ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? God told him that in the day you eat of it, you will surely die, right? Death, right? So check this out. In Romans 5.12, it says, Therefore, just as through one man, talking about Adam, sin entered into the world, and death through sin. 
And so death spread to all men because of all sin. So here's Adam, right? This little box right here. This is you and me. It's a whole human race. And when Adam sinned, right? Death, right? Like my little skull. Right? Death was, was imputed into Adam. At the moment he disobeyed God. And what happens is that every man born after Adam was deposited death. So in other words, you and I both have something inside of us called death. It comes from sin. And what that does is it separates us from God. We are separated from God. One man messed it up. That's what Paul says. Therefore, just as to, as to one man, sin entered into the world. And it spread to all men. See, it's a spiritual death. It's a spiritual death. And it was imputed into our account. And so when God sees our position, when God looks at you, he doesn't see you uh, as a drug addict, as an alcoholic, as a bum, as a, a prostitute, gang member, a thief, right? He, he doesn't look at you on what you are. He looks at you on what's inside of you. That is, is death. It has nothing to do with what you do or how you act. It's about a condition that we have. Men, death is in us. And that is all God sees is spiritual death. We were born spiritually dead. Because of our parents. Because our parents were spiritually dead, we were born spiritually dead. Are you with me? Because Adam represented the whole human race. And when Adam sinned, his sin was put into our account. How many of you carry baggage from your family, from your father, right? It's a picture of what was imputed into our life. Addictions, drugs, alcohol, name it. Death is imparted into our life. That's our problem. We have death. But one day, one day, a man named Jesus was born, right? And he lived as a child, as a human being. He grew up as a carpenter. He grew up as a man. And one day, he, he God called him to begin to do his ministry, which we all know. But his ministry was not to make disciples. His ministry wasn't to teach his ministry was to die on the cross. That was his whole purpose was to die on the cross to shed his blood where we can have salvation. Right? That's the beauty. That's why we're here. To celebrate the death, burial, and what? Resurrection. Because without the resurrection, we wouldn't be here. Yes. Amen. But understand this, when Jesus died on the cross, our sin, right, this little death person represents sin. Jesus took our death and put it into his account. Right? That happened on the cross. This was a transfer of something into Jesus' account. It didn't belong to Jesus. Hello? My sin didn't belong to Jesus. My guilt didn't belong to Jesus. My shame wasn't placed on Jesus. It was all placed on Jesus. Your shame, your sin, your guilt, everything that you've done in life was placed on Jesus at the cross. He took it all. The guilt you feel, 
the shame that you're, you're feeling this morning, Hello, because of sin, because of your shortcoming, the unworthiness that you feel. How many of you feel unworthy? That's good because that's that's a part of our sin. But the Bible tells us this is the good news: is that all that stuff was placed on Jesus at the cross. Are you with me? In Isaiah fifty-three. The word of the Lord reads like this. It says, Surely our griefs he himself what? Bore. And our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastities of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. He says, but all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. All of our shame, all of our sin that we've done in life, Jesus took on the cross. Very beautiful. We don't deserve that. I don't deserve that. I know who I am as a sinner. I don't deserve to be here. I don't even deserve to be on the pulpit. You know, I know where God brought me out of. Hello? But, but by his blood, by his mercy, by his grace, we're here today. We're all here today. Amen. See, in, in the Old Testament, it was custom that one had to identify with himself with a lamb, right? That he had offered as a sacrifice. And so, see that Rudy here, right? Lived in the Old Testament, a sinful man. And for him to be right with God, he would have to get a lamb and bring it to the priest for a sacrifice, for an atonement of his sins. And so what he would have to do is he would have to help the priest to, to gut and, and, and do all the whole sacrifice of the lamb. He had to hold down the lamb. He then would have to take out all the guts and, and put it on the burnt offering. He had to get his hands dirty. Because it was a picture of our, of our sins. Right? But what would happen is that he would have to put his hand on the head of the lamb. And it was a picture of, of the sins transporting uh, to the lamb. Imputing to the lamb. It was a picture of what Jesus would do on the cross. So it was custom for someone to identify himself with the lamb that he was about to offer as a sacrifice by placing his hand on the animal's head and transferring his sin to the animal. And then they would do the whole ceremony. Amen. And then there was a, a day of atonement, right? Where the high priest would take two goats. One goat he will lay his hands on the goat to confess the sins of a whole nation over the goat. And then they will sacrifice one goat. Right? And then there was another goat that they would release it into the wilderness. That goat was called an escape goat. But it was a picture that God was removing our sins to never return. And it was sometimes that, that goat would wander back into the village and the uh, people would freak out and God, hasn't, he hasn't forgiven us. And, and so what they would be end up doing was they'll, they'll push the goat off the, uh, off the mountain, off a cliff. Make sure that that goat ain't coming back. Right? And so the high priest would literally push the goat off the cliff. But it was called a scapegoat. 
There's two goats. One was for the sacrifice of our sins. And the other one was to forget our sins. For we could be right with God. Amen. But the priest would have to he would lay his hands on the goat to transfer it. The word is called imputation to impute the sins into that goat. Are you with me? There, there's something about the laying of hands of transfer. Amen. It's called transfer. In, in the Bible, there's a thing called parental blessings, where the parent will bless their children. Are you with me? And we see it with with uh, with it all throughout the Bible. In Genesis, you you see Abraham will bless his children, right? Isaac will bless his children, and so forth. And Jacob, and you'll see that he will lay his hands on, them because it was a picture. Of transferring the blessings upon their life. Hey, here come, come close to me, right? Remember how when Esau and, and Jacob, how they betrayed each other, right? But what did the father have to do? Touch his head. He had to touch him. It was a picture of a transferring the blessings. Are you with me this morning? Are, are you seeing where I'm going at? See, Jesus became our escape goat. He became our uh, sacrificial goat. All everything was imputed into Christ. Our sin, our shame, Jesus took on the cross. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the word, the word of the Lord reads, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. It's beautiful. I don't know if you get what I'm preaching this morning is that because Jesus took our sin, we're now able to be free to receive the righteousness of Jesus. Are you with me? 1 Peter 2.24 The word of the Lord reads, And he himself, talking about Jesus, he bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to what? Righteousness. For by his wounds you are healed. For you were continually strained like sheep. But now you have returned to the shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Peter said, man, you're stubborn. You wander away like sheep. But Jesus took your sin for so you don't have to wonder no more. Are you with me? But understand this, you cannot escape the fact that Jesus bore your sins. Your sins were put on Jesus. Your sins was placed on the cross of Calvary. You can't, you can't deny it. It's all through scripture. It's, it's the main ingredient in the Bible. Are you with me? The good news is this. Is that the righteousness of Jesus was imparted to every believer. Not every person, to every believer. To those who believe in Jesus. Those who believe that Jesus died on the cross. Those who believe his righteousness. Right, I got this little crown. Right, I got him Burger King. Right, that's spray painted gold. Right. But it represents the righteousness of, of Christ. His righteousness was then now imparted into man. So the day that you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, right? The day you get saved, his righteousness was imparted into your life. But this doesn't take effect until Jesus rose from the dead. Because it's through the resurrection of power is where we can find righteousness. 
Are you with me? Jesus put into his righteousness into our account. Understand this. If, if, if sin only started and stopped at Jesus, right? If sin only stopped where Jesus took our sins and he didn't do nothing for us, we'd be broke. We'd be broke. <clears throat> to say that you were in debt a thousand dollars in your bank, right? Negative a thousand. Right? You get a stimulus of a thousand dollars. Right? What does that do to your account? Nothing. It just balances to zero. And, and that's what Jesus said at, at the cross. When he took our sins, it balances us at zero. There we, we have nothing to give back to God. That's why Jesus had to die and, and raise again for he could then impart to us his righteousness for now we can stand right before God. Not based on us, but based on Jesus. Are you with me? See, if, if this only took stop at, at step one, or Jesus at the cross taking our sins, we will have been clean. We will have a clean account, but no basis of righteousness. And that means that God cannot receive us into his presence. But when Jesus imparts into us his righteousness, this gives us the basis to enter the presence of God. Amen. That's why God is able to show up in this place. Not because we're righteous. None of us are righteous. None of us are righteous. But because Jesus is righteous, and the day I, I repented, the day I got, I got I'm already clean. And now I have a righteousness of God. Here I am. Lord, here I am. Use me. Not based on what people think. The people, when they see you, all they want to think is your sins. Oh, you know, you'll never be right with God. You know, the Bible tells us if we repent of our sins, that if we confess our sins, he is righteous and just to forgive us, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Right? And through the blood of Jesus, we now have a new righteousness in Christ. Hey! Don't listen to the haters. Come on. <clears throat> man. I'm, I'm almost done, man. Romans 1, 16 to 17. Look what Paul says. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. What does Paul say? I am not ashamed of what? The gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let's check it out. For in it, in what? The gospel. What's the gospel? That Jesus died for our sins, right? He was buried in the tomb. And he was raised on the third day, right? That's the gospel. In the gospel... <laughs> Is the righteousness of God. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And is it written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. It is by believing what Jesus did for me. It is by faith that I'm a righteous man today. Even though I'm a sinner, even though I make my mistakes. In God's eyes, I'm righteous. Man. Hello? Beautiful. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. Man. Salvation is for anyone. Salvation is for you. Salvation is for me. Anyone who is lost, Anyone who is broken, when you believe that if Jesus, it takes a little step of faith, believe that Jesus took all your shame, all your sin onto him on the cross. Right? At least you listen to the Bible. (laughs) 
Maybe it wasn't something else. I have a bad experience with that one time. But when I wasn't saved, I used to run this, the uh, music in the back. And, and I had a early music on a little cassette player. And I had a, I had a little way of, of, of screwing up music, right? Got all that top and screw type of guy. And so I had it screwed up, but I had headphones in, right? If it wasn't plugged in right, it will come out on the speakers. <laughs> and during the altar call, uh, a, a, a whole word came out, oh my God, again. <laughs> so you, you're lucky it was just uh, the word of God. <laughs> but Jesus took all that shame, man. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That, that's in the past. Amen. For in the gospel is the righteousness of God is revealed to us through the gospel. If you want to be right with God, it's called righteousness. If you want, if you want to be right with God, you got to accept Jesus into your heart. Believe that he died on the cross and, and, and invite him into your life. Then now, Keep your right with God. Are you with me? In Romans 3 21, it reads like this But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested by witness by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. So to whoever believes, whoever believes, you will find the righteousness of God. Now the Bible says that there is none righteous. Not even one. It's Romans 3 2. There's none righteous. None of us. But because of what Jesus did, we can find righteousness. It's not ours. The righteousness that was, was placed into us came from Jesus. But wasn't it Jesus right with God? Didn't Jesus live a blameless life? Because of that, we can live a blameless life. In Philippians 3, this is more than that I count all things to be lost in view of surpassing the value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Christ not having the righteousness of my own driven from the law but that which is true faith in Christ the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship with his sufferings being conformed to his death. Through the death and burial of Jesus, we can find a righteousness to stand right before God. And that's why we're able to worship here in this building. At the same time, the body of Christ is worshiping God all over the world. And he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Because we can stand right before God. Because God sees the blood. God sees the atonement. And when he sees you, he doesn't see you. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. That's what God sees. It's his righteousness, not yours. That's why he's able to still come to you. In all of our mess, and in the darkness we surround ourselves, God can still come to you. Because it's not based on your righteousness. It's based on the righteousness of Jesus. See, as, as Adam's sin was imputed to our account, so is the righteousness of Jesus. So how can we be made the righteousness of God? The Bible says this. In Hebrews 9.14, it says, How much more would the blood of Christ 
who through the eternal spirit offer himself up without blemish to God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So how can I receive the righteousness of God? What well, is by the blood of Jesus? It is by the blood of Christ we can now have a righteousness, not by works that's dead, but by faith in Christ. And Hebrews 10:14. This is for by one offering, by one sacrifice, he perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So in Christ, you are sanctified in Jesus. What does that mean, sanctified? To be made clear right. You're clear, you've been made clear right. There's no uh, condemnation, there's no guilt. It's been uh, uh, wiped away. Your slate is clean. That's why when, when I see someone that comes back to the home, like when, when, I, when I have a good conversation, is have you repented of your sins? Yes, that's it. In God's eyes, yeah, that's it. I, I, don't, I don't even want to talk about your past. I don't want to know what happened. Man. Because in God's eyes, you're already made clear right. You just got to get on that bike. This is my conclusion. Is the righteousness of God belongs to us. It belongs to you because we have believed in Jesus and his finished work at the cross. When we place our faith in Jesus, we share everything that Jesus is. Everything that is of Jesus. It's why I, I teach the home is the in Christ principle. And I, I share with some of you a few times. What is the in Christ principle? Is whatever is true of Christ is true of me. That's the in Christ principle. All right? Let me borrow someone's pen or highlighter. Thank you. Let me give you an illustration of what in Christ means. As this pen is in, in, in place in this Bible, right? It became one with the Bible. So whatever happens to the pen happens, or whatever, or whatever happens to the Bible happens to the pen, because it's in one, right? Amen. It's in, 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 in the Bible. So when I put my Bible under this pulpit, where's the where's the pen at? Under the pulpit, why? Because it's in the Bible, right? If happy gets my Bible because he's mad and he throws it into the dumpster, <laughs> where, where does the pen go? Into the dumpster. Why? Because it's in the Bible. If Rudy gets mad at me, he's my Bible and he ships it off to China. Right? Where does the pen go? To China. Why? Because it's in the Bible. So whatever happens to the Bible happens to the pen. Because the pen is in the Bible. Right? The Word of God is Christ. You and I are this pen. So whatever happened to Jesus happens to us. You understand that? First Corinthians 1.30 It's on the screen. Check it out. It says, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who began to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Because we're in Christ. The wisdom of God became clear for us. That now we're righteous. That means we're now can now stand right before God. Sanctification means you declare not guilty. You're not sanctified. You're not set apart for Jesus. And you've been redeemed. Meaning you've been bought back by God because we're in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him who knew no sin to be sent on our behalf. So that we 
by becoming the righteousness of God in Christ. Philippians 3 9. And it may be found in him, in who? In Jesus. Not having a righteousness of my own, driven from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. What is faith? Believing in Christ. Believing. I'm about done. The worship team can come up. Understand this, God does not ignore your sin. God does not ignore your sin. Understand that. We, we all fall short, right? We all have sin. But understand, God does not ignore sin. He settles it. He settles your sin. And the way he settles it is by placing it in Jesus. He settles your sin. And then what he does is he gets the righteousness of, of Christ and he puts it into your account. So that you can know God. So that you can love God. Are you with me, church? Jesus loves you. I don't know what you've done in the past. Well, you know what you've done. I don't. And, and all of us in our hearts, we want to be right with God. And I, I, we all do. But our sin will push us away. Our shame will push us away. But God's trying to draw you back to him. And, and you don't have to do nothing but just believe. You go back to your faith. Believing that Jesus loves that he died on the cross for your sins. So this morning, all you have to do is confess to God, God, I messed up. Forgive me. I reopen my heart to you. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. You have to rededicate your life back to Jesus. And God, you already made clear, but we have to do confession to him. So this morning, stand with me.